Hello, everyone. <laughs> so give me one second. I'm putting the, um, as soon as I can, I will put uh, the Instagram, but uh, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, and here it is. Yeah, we are able to make uh, Instagram work. So that's it. Finally, I figured it out after a month. So um, as usual, I'm Dr. Isabelle Amig. I'm a board certified rheumatologist, uh, both in France and in the US, in fact. And I work in Colorado mostly, but I also work remotely with telehealth in other states, if you're interested in looking into the practice. Go to onabridgemd.com and you will le learn a lot more. Today, we are continuing our series with Sjogren syndrome, which is the most common autoimmune uh, disorder out there. And I wanted to discuss how we diagnose Sjogren today. And I'm going to start with a story because I think stories are so powerful. So uh, I'm going to actually tell you a couple of stories because it will uh, um, help us with our points. The first story is that of a patient that I saw not, uh, well, actually several years ago. And she presented with extreme fatigue, a lot of fatigue. And she had uh, also dis uh, discovered that she was having more and more cavities and felt that she had gum recession. And uh, also every morning when you asked her, she was complaining that uh, she couldn't open her eyes because they were stuck, because they were so dry. And she had this sensation of having sand in her eyes. She was easy uh, right away. We checked the ANA, it was positive. We checked the SSC and SSB, they were positive. We made a diagnosis of Sjogren, okay? Typical. Uh, I'm going to tell you another story, which is a patient that presented with extreme fatigue also. Uh, fatigue is definitely something that's very common in patients with Sjogren. And uh, she, on the other hand, had seen many rheumatologists and many physicians uh, overall. And she actually developed um, what they call fibromyalgia with this idea of like everything that uh, she was, every time someone was touching her, she felt pain as if she had done uh, a workout that was extremely intense. Uh, and so she couldn't have anyone, like it, she couldn't even handle uh, hugs from her husband. And uh, this patient also complained on dry eyes and dry mouth. Um, and uh, this time for her, she only had, so she had SSA, SSB that was negative, but then we checked her ANA and that was positive. And then we did a biopsy of her minor salivary gland. Remember what I was telling you last time, it's, you can actually feel those salivary gland um, and they are minor because the big one are the power type and the submandibular here that make the saliva, but under the, uh, the, the lips, you also have salivary glands. And so we made a biopsy of that salivary gland and it showed us typical Sjogren, a typical um, uh, symptom, like signs of Sjogren. So she also had Sjogren. Now, let me tell you another story, which is a patient with uh, extreme fatigue again, because it's just super common. And a little bit of dry eyes, dry mouth, really when you're asking her, but really our main issue is shortness of breath and cough, dry cough, a lot of dry cough. And when he did her uh, imaging of her lungs, we found that she had what we call interstitial lung disease and a very typical interstitial lung disease with cysts in it. And it turns out that um, she had never seen a rheumatologist because really our main issue was uh, this shortness of breath and this cough. And um, so the, this patient was uh, in like a soft first pulmonary dogs. And when we saw her CT scan, she, she was referred to us um, in rheumatology to see if this could be rheumatologic. And it turns out it was, uh, and it was also another manifestation of Sjogren. And in her case, SSCSSB was also positive. Um, and then finally, another uh, uh, example is a patient that, uh, so let me think. Yeah, so I had a patient that presented with uh, neuropathy, so nerve involvement. So um, she couldn't feel her uh, feet uh, as much as usual. And it had progressed over the years. And she also had joint pain uh, that was inflammatory. So remember the pain that's worse in the morning, associated with morning stiffness and so on. And this patient, um, 
all the uh, autoimmune, so she thought she had an autoimmune and she had actually looked uh, online and she was like, I have dry eyes, I have dry mouth, I also have this neuropathy, can this be sugar? And so she actually is the one who came up with the diagnosis. But uh, our first doc was like, no, this is not a sugar end because you're positive, you're negative ANA, you're negative SSA, you're negative SSB. Uh, but actually, when we did the biopsy, again, of the minor salivary gland, we found that she had indeed sugar end. Like, it was consistent with sugar end. All right. So all of those cases, all of those patients have sugar end. Some of them are worse than some others. So the one with the severe neuropathy, the one with the lung disease, those are more severe than the one that have just dry eyes, dry mouth. But they all have sugar end. So I'm going to refer you back to the first to see like what the symptoms of sugar ends are. You can look at it under Rheumatology 101 on the YouTube video that they leave there. I don't know that they leave on uh, Instagram but they'll definitely leave Rheumatology 101 by Dr. Uh, Amig, A-M-I-G-U-E-S. You can look at that live uh, from last week for all of the symptomatology, like all the signs of chagrin. I think right now what I want to focus on is how do we diagnose chagrin? So let's say you or your rheumatologist or your primary care physician is thinking, oh, I think you may have chagrin. How do we make a diagnosis? So you can look at the classification criteria. Know that the classification criteria are for diagnostic purposes, for research purpose. And the reason why I share this is that you have to realize that we don't fit necessarily all the boxes. And uh, rheumatology is an art, it's a medical art. Uh, and it might be that you don't feel necessarily those criteria. So you could not go into a study uh, that needs you to fill this criteria, but that doesn't mean necessarily that you do not have sugar grant. You may not fill all of the criteria for sugar grant, but you fill many. And that's enough for us to say, well, you probably have sugar grant, so we're going to treat you as such, right? Um, so you can look at that. And what we see in those criteria is that you most, like, you know, we put numbers depending on uh, the symptoms that you have and what they mean for us for sugar grant. Again, those criteria were created by experts, meaning that they are not perfect. And we change criteria as time goes when the study, like the science is advancing. So for example, lupus criteria have changed many times over the years because science showed us some new things so that you can have lupus with a negative ANA if you have lupus nephritis. And that's kind of the same in Sjogren. You can have Sjogren with negative ANA, negative SSA, SSB, or negative rheumatoid factor if you have evidence of symptoms that are consistent with Sjogren, and then you have a biopsy that's consistent with Sjogren as well, okay? So that's really important. Number one, you don't need autoimmune uh, antibodies if you have symptoms that are very consistent with Sjogren and you have a biopsy consistent with Sjogren. Uh, you can also have antibodies that are positive, but you have no symptoms. In those cases, you don't have sugar and you just have antibodies uh, that maybe put you at more risk to develop sugar, but that doesn't mean that you have sugar. So in general, what in rheumatology we do to make a diagnosis is, and, and then sugar and particularly, is that you're going to go and you're going to ask all of those questions to see what symptoms do you have. And those symptoms are going to make us think, okay, maybe this is sugar. And so the dry eyes, the dry mouth, the dry vagina, the um, fatigue, the joint pain, um, and so on. The neuropathy, the lung disease with interstitial lung disease with cystic uh, uh, changes. Those are things that are going to make us think like this looks like sugar. And it's behaving like sugar, right? And then you're going to look at the blood work. So you're going to look at the ANA. Rheumatoid factor, SSA, SSB. Why those four? Because they are associated with Sjogren. So SSA, SSB, definitely more specific for Sjogren. But you can have a positive ANA or a positive rheumatoid factor, and that would be consistent with Sjogren. Then you're also looking at some other blood work that are going to tell you that this type of Sjogren is potentially more severe. Those are low C4, elevated rheumatoid factor, and why is because those two are associated with cryo, which is a uh, uh, protein, remember, it's, uh, the protein that can basically uh, agglutinate, so they, it cryoprecipitates 
due to cold, for example, okay? Uh, and those patients who have cryo rheumatoid fracture or low C4, and rheumatoid fracture and low C4, by the way, are a good way for you to know that you could have cryo, because that's associated. Uh, uh, and low, so I said low C4, rheumatoid fracture, or cryo. Those are some signs that you may be at risk for a more severe chagrin. So we will want to see you every six months instead of every year once you're in, you know, you have no symptoms. I like to see my patients more often, but if you're perfect, we still would like you to see be seen every six months because you're more at risk. And then we would probably ask you to do blood work every six months because again, you're more at risk. And when we say at risk is that Remember last time I was saying that one of the complications of Sjogren, because it is uh, affecting the B cell, the lymphocytes B, one of the complications is lymphoma. That is also a B cell issue. Remember, like, so it's this proliferation of B cell that is not, you don't want to be proliferative. You want it to be like done in a proper way, in a balanced way. And with uh, Sjogren, it's not balanced. And when this imbalance go crazy, it can actually cause lymphoma. Not to worry, we have an incredible treatment also for that. But it's better to see it early, right? You don't want the fire to spread. You want to stop the fire at the beginning of the fire. And that is exactly what we can do when it comes to Sjogren, because we can actually look at that. And so we're going to check your SPEP and your immunoglobulin. So we can look at the number of immunoglobulin you have. And in your case, you would have more. Um, in, uh, in certain type of immunoglobulin. So for example, you may have more immunoglobulin G, for example. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your immune system is super strong. That is actually a sign that it's not in balance. So we wanna look at that, okay? So we would look at that and we can actually sometimes predict when you may develop you know, uh, uh, lymphoma. It's actually less and less common lymphoma, which is good because we know how to treat your chagrin more and more, okay? We'll talk about uh, treatment next time. Now, the third thing is to do a biopsy. Look, if you have a positive SSCSSB, if you have typical symptoms, I don't recommend biopsy. Like, what, what is it going to tell me? Not much. And honestly, so in France, I used to do the biopsy and I didn't have much issues here. The biopsies are done and they are very deep because they don't want to miss uh, but I have seen a little bit of um, issues with it in the sense that you may not feed it or things like that. And so I do, I keep the biopsies for patients where we need to know what's going on and we're not sure. Uh, and so the biopsy is actually super easy. You like just cut the, the lip inside and you just take that little piece of this little bum that you're feeding. You just take a little piece and go for it and take that. And then you look under the microscope. Uh, I mean, not you, the pathologist. And the pathologist is going to look for, remember, like focus of inflammation as well as scarring. And that is what's going to tell us, yes, this is consistent with Sjogren. We do this when we have negative SSA, SSB, uh, and, and when we are wondering where we are at um, in terms of, like, is this Sjogren or is this something else? There's no, like, if there is, negative, uh, if you have positive SSA, SSB, you have rheumatoid factor that's positive, you have low C4, you have positive ANA, honestly, I don't think you need a, a biopsy. Um, for research purposes, probably, uh, but honestly, like, I don't think it's going to change your treatment. And that is why I'm saying that. I used to do them all of the time. Like they would come to our, I remember when I was in France, they would come to our department and we would just do biopsy on everyone. That has changed. <laughs> that has changed. We don't need a biopsy on everyone. Okay. We can also do biopsy of the nerve if we have nothing else and we don't know what's going on. Sometimes we will recommend biopsy of the nerve. But very often, like very often, we do not need that. Like I, I, I think I may have needed that once in my lifetime as a physician. Uh, but overall, this is what we do. First, what are your symptoms? Are they consistent with Sjogren? Do they all fit Sjogren? Second is, do you have any sort of antibodies that are consistent with Sjogren? Remember, ANA, rheumatoid factor, as well as SSA, SSB. Those are the main ones. Then do you have any risk factor for more severe Sjogren? Low C4, rheumatoid factor, cryo, and then immunoglobulin that are high. Those are like the main one. And then finally, all of this is negative, then let's do a biopsy, okay? Um, I think that that's pretty much it. 
Next time, we're talking about how we think in terms of treatment of chagrin. Uh, I think it would be uh, uh, really nice, but you can ask your question. Don't hesitate to ask your question. Again, if, you're, uh, if you want to see the previous episodes, go on YouTube. That's where they live. Uh, subscribe to the channel so you're not missing. And then, you know, you can see those lives uh, on uh, uh, regularly on YouTube. And otherwise, I will see you next week. I hope this is helpful. Uh, and I'm Dr. Isabel Amig from Rheumatology, uh, Rheumatologist and Unabridged MD in Denver, Colorado. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.